And good morning, everybody, and welcome to worship here at West Island. So thankful that you've chosen to join with us today, and we've come together to worship the Lord and just to give Him praise today. And we're going to be singing a, an older hymn to begin with, and we have so much to be thankful for. Uh, even as we walk through this difficult time, we have so much to give the Lord thanks for. And so we're going to begin with prayer, and we're going to give thanks for His goodness in our lives, and we're going to invite the Lord to minister to us today. Father, we thank You for Your presence. I thank You that wherever we are right now, that You're with us. And Lord, today as we have gathered together virtually to give You praise, and Lord, to hear from Your Word, I pray that You would speak into our hearts. I pray that our praise and our worship as we worship together would be acceptable in your sight. Lord, I pray that you would be blessed by it as we're blessed by you. And Lord, we give you thanks for your goodness to us and your blessing to us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And we're going to begin by singing a hymn that simply says, I see a crimson stream of blood. And this hymn was written by Bishop G.T. Haywood many years ago. Uh, one of, and this is uh, Black History Month. And the history of the Pentecostal movement is rich. And whether it's William Seymour, G.T. Haywood, or others, we're blessed by our diversity. And so as we sing this, would you give thanks for the sacrifice of Jesus at the cross as he paid the price for our sins? Glad refrain 
Hallelujah, Lord, I thank you for the blood. I thank you for the blood. I thank you for the blood. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. And we are so thankful for the blood of Jesus Christ that has paid the price for every sin that we have ever committed. And what a hope we have. Today no condemnation abides to turn away my soul from his salvation. He's in my heart to stay. Oh, I, I know that you, like me, have probably been in the place where gloom and sadness whisper, you've sinned, no use to pray. But I like the words of that song. But I look away to Jesus, and he tells me to say, I see a crimson stream. Oh, I, I hope you're glad about that crimson stream today that blesses us, that saves us, hallelujah, that paid the price for our sins. And uh, because of that crimson stream, we're going to be going to prayer in, right now. And we know that we have access to the very throne of God by the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for us. Not because we are so good, not because we are worthy, but because his blood was shed for us. And today as we go to prayer, we have a number of needs that I want to mention this morning as particular prayer focuses, and there are so many needs that are on our prayer list today. But I want to particularly remember, I remember the Rojas family in prayer, uh, Sister Rocio and her family, the passing of David and Raymond, her uncles, and also her uncle Jorge is in hospital in very serious condition in Mexico, and we want to pray that God would just be comfort to the family and that God would minister to Jorge today, minister healing. We also uh, want to remember uh, Brother Gershon's sister Le uh, Raquel in prayer, that God would perform a miracle of healing for her. Also the Lewis family, uh, Sister Denise's nephew passed away early this morning and we want to remember uh, her family in prayer today. We also want to remember Vivian and Michael as they continue treatments, and uh, we are thankful. We've been praying for Alain for some time, and he has been transferred to a rehabilitation hospital and has been making progress, so we're very thankful for that. And for all of the needs that you have today, whether they're needs of healing or they're needs of salvation, it may be a spiritual need. It may be emotional. This time has been very difficult, whether it's just that feeling of confinement or loneliness, depression, we want to pray that God would minister. We also want to pray uh, that the Lord would minister to those who have been affected financially. And then for all of those who are working in uh, health care today, those from our church, those in our community, we want to pray for those that are uh, working in, in jobs that are dealing on the front lines, that God would just protect and watch over. Also for those that are suffering from COVID today, and we want to pray for them and just ask the Lord to minister. And so as we pray, I want to invite you to take your need to the Lord right now. And let's ask God to make a difference because we see a crimson stream of blood that provides us access. Lord Jesus, today we come to you and we know that you are the comforter of all that mourn. Lord, that you don't walk away from us in our pain, but you stand beside us, and Lord, you bring comfort. Today, we ask you for the Rojas family, that you would bring comfort to them. Lord, that your, your peace would be their portion today. I pray for Sister Denise and her family, and I pray that you would bring peace into their hearts. Lord, we thank you for the peace that you alone can bring. I pray for Raquel today that your touch would be on her life, that you would minister healing. I pray for Vivian. I pray for Michael, Lord Jesus, your healing power to be in their lives. I pray for Alain as he continues recovery. Lord Jesus, touch today. Lord, little Josiah, thank you for the good report thus far, but Lord, there's still more, and we pray that you would completely heal. Lord, for each need of healing, for each need of finance, for those that are struggling emotionally or spiritually today. Lord, for those that have needs of finance. Lord, you are Jehovah Jireh. You are our provider, and we pray for that today. And we ask you that you would just minister. 
Lord, as we are in this live stream today and we join together, Lord, I pray that you will touch each heart, each life, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. And we're going to sing one more song, and this is a familiar chorus that has come to mean so much, and we've learned it not only in English, but in French and Spanish as well. And we want to invite you just to uh, sing along with us and give the Lord thanks because He is worthy of all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. And right now, in your living room, your bedroom, your kitchen, your family room, it's a little cold to be out on your deck, but wherever you are, would you just go ahead and lift your hands and say, Lord, I give you praise and I give you glory today. Lord, I just lift you up above everything and everyone. Hallelujah. Well, I don't know if you can feel what I'm feeling where you are, but I feel the presence of God. That today, as we lift our hands in worship, we know that God is with us. And you might be struggling today, but God is with you. You might be on the mountaintop of victory today. God is with you. You might be having a so-so kind of blah day, but God is with you. And one way to change one of those so-so days into a great day, one way to change a day of struggle into a day of victory is simply to lift your hands and realign your thinking from the problem to the solution. From the God who loves you, to, from the problem that devastates you to the God who loves you. Today, would you do that as we sing this song? Sing along with us. This isn't the show. We're here to worship the Lord together. And, and I want to invite you and encourage you to do just that today as we sing this song. You deserve the glory and the honor as we lift our As we magnify your name, you deserve the glory and the honor. As we lift our hands in worship, as we magnify. Yeah. 
you together. We unite our hearts in worship, whether it's in Pierre Farr or Dollard or Point Claire, in St. Anne de Bellevue or Pancor or Il Perot, in Hudson, in St. Lazare, in Vaudreuil, in Laval, in Saint Laurent. Lord, I, I thank you that in Dorval we unite our hearts together. Hallelujah. In Roxborough, Lord, and in Il Bazaar, Lord, I pray wherever your people are right now that we join our hearts together. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. From the downtown, we thank you. Lord, from the east end, we thank you. Hallelujah. We, hallelujah. 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 Lord, in LaSalle, we give you praise. In Lachine, Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us today. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, it's wonderful to be able to give the Lord thanks. This time, Rebecca is going to bring the announcements for the morning. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad that you all chose to be here with us this morning live. And if you're watching this in the archive, I'm glad that you chose to watch us at whatever time you are watching us at. So, and join, not watch us. This isn't a show. You're joining with us in service. So, Announcements for this week. First of all, I mention it every week, our digital bulletin. So if you are not already subscribed, what are you waiting for? All you have to do is either send an email to admin at westellenchurch.com and say you would like to be added to the digital bulletin send out an email, or you can go to westellenchurch.com, scroll down a little bit, there's a text box, you enter your email and you can subscribe there. All you have to do is check your emails once you click the button and um, confirm your subscri subscription. Who knew that was a hard word to say? Next, Tuesday night at 7.30 is our second men's meeting. So be there. It's always a great time. I know I haven't been to the men's one, but I go to the ladies one and it's always a great time. And so I'm sure that it's fun for the men too. Uh, Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. on Zoom. And as usual, the code for the Zoom is in your digital bulletin. Then Wednesday at 7 p.m., again, 7 p.m., not 7.30, is our live stream Bible study. So, um, yeah, it's always a great time to dive into the Word, to look at different aspects of the Word. And then... At around 8 o'clock is our Digging Deeper, it's our Zoom discussion on what was talked about in the Bible study. So at 8 p.m., that's on Zoom, 
we all know where to find that code. Then, Saturday morning, 10 a.m., always a good time. Love it. So, Sunday morning, Sunday morning, Saturday morning, 10 a.m., is our Kids Church Online. Uh, we had a great time this week with Sister Sharon teaching the Bible story on Jacob and Esau. And this coming week is going to be my turn. And we're going to be looking at Joseph and his brothers and that whole story. So be there. It's going to be a great time. I'm going to do my signature, one of my favorite things to do for my lessons. So if you know, you know. And if you don't know, join us and find out. So that is Kitch Church at 10 a.m. And then at 6 p.m. in your home is prayer. So we encourage you from 6 until 7 to join with us in prayer. Um, although we cannot join in person to pray like we would before this whole pandemonium, um, <laughs> we can still join together in prayer at our house. So 6 until 7, and then at 6.45 is prayer on Zoom. So that is where they take specific needs to in prayer, um, but as a group of people praying and believing together. Then, finally... Sunday morning at 11 a.m., church online. And so, like I always say, it's important to join us for church on Sunday morning at 11. Although we are at our house, we're not in, well, I'm not at my house. But although you're at your house, you're not in the building with us, you can still uh, go to church, go to church together. Um, it's always a great time. I encourage you to join us either on Facebook or on YouTube, whatever you may be on right now, and you can share it with your friends. Encourage them to log on. So, lastly is offering. I want to say again, thank you so much for your generous offering and giving, your continuous giving in tithes. Um, it really, it does help support the church. And the two ways that you can give in offering or tithes is either through Interact eTransfer, so admin at West Island, or oh, sorry, give at westislandchurch.com. I'm getting all my emails mixed up today. Give at westislandchurch.com, or you can um, call Pastor Price or Sister Price and set up a time to drop off your tithes and offerings, and they'll be glad to set it up for you. And yeah, that is all for this morning. And thank you, Rebecca. And uh, we're going to go right into the scripture today. And uh, I am going to be beginning a new series this morning as we um, are moving quickly into the month of March. And I want to draw your attention to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter number 13. And we're going to look at one verse of scripture, verse number 33. Matthew chapter 13, verse number 33. And uh, while you're getting that on your, on your Bible or your tablet, your, whatever way you, you look up the verses, Matthew 13, 33, I do want to mention a big thank you to Brother Brent Isaac who brought a fantastic message uh, last week. And I, I appreciate that message. I think every time he preaches, it just gets a little bit better. And uh, did a great job last Sunday morning. Uh, Matthew 13, verse number 33, another parable spake he unto them, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. And this morning I want to begin, now I'm still so used to saying let's pray together and you may be seated, but this morning we're going to be looking at and starting a series on the parables of Jesus and we're going to call it Stories That Jesus Told. Now, if you're taking notes, this morning's message is entitled Bread Dough Lessons. Bread Dough Lessons. So we're going to be talking about, in the next few weeks, the parables of Jesus. Now, a parable is simply a very simple story that illustrates a spiritual truth. So as we look at them, some things that are important for us to understand. They are drawn from everyday life. Jesus uh, 
looked around him. We would call them in many ways illustrations today. He looked around. He saw things that were everyday goings on. And he used them to illustrate a spiritual point. Now, a couple of things to, to remember as we look at these. First of all, they are meant to convey a specific point, but they are not meant to uh, have every little thing about them mean something. They are meant to convey a general point. Uh, and, and as we look at them, it's important as we look at them that we understand the custom and the culture of the day, because their time was very different from ours. They were an agricultural society. They grew a lot of their own food. Uh, there were some cities, but very agricultural. And, of course, they didn't have the conveniences that we have today. So it was a very different time. This morning, as we kick this off, and there are so many great parables, but I wanted to kick it off with perhaps one of the shortest. As a matter of fact, verse 33 and verse 32 compete for the title of shortest parable in the Bible. Uh, verse 32 is about a mustard seed that grew to be great. Verse 33 is a companion parable, very similar in its purpose, as Jesus looks at the people who are around him and begins to tell a story. It is interesting how most of us learn better through stories. It's the stories of life that we remember and that we are, are able more easily to appropriate into our lives. So stories. Uh, we love stories. Uh, I, am, I am reading some a couple of different books that focus on stories right now. And wow, there's something about stories. We remember them. So a, a parable is a simple earthly story to illustrate a spiritual point. And this story is about a baker, a, a woman who is getting ready to make bread. Now, we see this same recipe. Jesus said that she took leaven and she hid it in three measures of meal. It seems like this was a common recipe uh, that was used in the day, the three measures of meal. It's mentioned several times in the Old Testament when they would go to make bread. It was three measures of meal, and they would uh, put the leaven in it. Now, this may be a little-known fact that you may not know about me, but I can make bread. I, I can make whole grain bread, I can make white bread, I, I have made bread, I will make bread. I didn't make bread today. I should have made a loaf and brought it with me. But I know how to make bread. Now, for those of you who are doubting me, let me add a little addendum there that I know how to make bread in a bread maker. And it's easy. You know, if you've never tried it, guys, I want to encourage you, impress those that you know. You can make bread. All you have to do is be able to read a recipe and measure out the ingredients. And so some of the recipes that I've used, you know, there's flour and there's water. And then there's yeast. The, the Bible uses the term leaven as the term for yeast. And so I, I can make bread. But I know that, you know, that yeast, and, and when you make it in a bread maker, and that's my area of expertise, you know, I, I have made it years ago, uh, doing it the old-fashioned way where you have to knead it and then let it rise and, and all of that. Now, my, I'm fortunate enough to be married to a woman who knows how to bake and who makes rolls and bread from scratch and, and doesn't have to use a bread maker. And in that case... I consider myself to be the official dough tester. So if it's chocolate chip cookies, I am the chocolate chip cookie dough tester. I, it is an extremely important job. The weight of the world rests upon my shoulders because we wouldn't want to have substandard cookies turned out. So whether it's the white cookies, whether it's the, the chocolate cookies, whether it's chocolate chip cookies, or whether it's bread, I consider myself to be the official dough tester in my house. It is an unappreciated job sometimes. As a matter of fact, 
Sometimes, and I hope I don't get in trouble for this, but sometimes I am told, don't you touch that dough. There is just enough for what I'm doing. But it's an important job, and sometimes you have to take one for the team. Guys, you know what I'm talking about. You just have to. So this woman is making bread, and, and she puts the yeast in the bread. And there's something about making bread, and I know enough about making bread to know that if you don't put the yeast in, it doesn't turn out to be light and fluffy. But this story about this woman, unnamed, but a very, a very common household task, this story is actually, it's not about yeast and bread recipes. It's not about, you know, how many eggs you might use. And, and you know, one of my, uh, one of my daughters spe- kind of specializes in making challah bread. And, you know, it's, it's made differently. It's not about what recipe that you use. This story is actually about influence. Jesus is using this very common incident to talk about influence, to talk about, about how the yeast, as it's inserted into the meal and the water is added, that activates the yeast, that that, that yeast begins to spread its influence throughout the entire uh, measures of meal. I, I was looking at this, and it is interesting because when we look at this recipe, uh, we, we think that, well, it's, she's just making a loaf of bread, but that's really not the case. Um, she's, she's making about, she's got about 22, I think it's 22 liters of meal, three measures. It's a lot of bread. And maybe she wants to make it and keep it for some time and doesn't want to be bothered having to make it again. But she is making a lot of bread. And this story is about how something that is very small ends up influencing something that is very large. Let me draw back to my vast experience in making bread, bread maker bread. That when I put in the flour and when I put in the other ingredients, the yeast is one of the smallest measures of ingredient that goes into that bread. There's way more flour, but it's the yeast that causes the bread to rise, and and its influence is felt throughout the whole loaf. What Jesus is talking about here is the staggering influence, and I want you to think about this, the staggering influence that followers of Jesus would have, because he's talking about his kingdom, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven. He's talking about the influence of his kingdom on the earth. That it began with obscurity. It began with something small. It began with just 12 apostles. It began with just 120 in an upper room. But it spread to impact around the world. To the proportions that we know it today. It's a story about the kingdom. The kingdom was a problem for the disciples of Jesus and for his enemies as well. Their concepts and their values of the kingdom were worlds apart from the kingdom that Jesus came to put in place. See, a lot of people had a problem to accept Jesus as Messiah because they were looking for a political and military leader who would overthrow the hated Romans and set up his throne in Jerusalem and and he would reign forever there and and everything would be good. There were misconceptions. Even the disciples of Jesus had a problem with this. Art thou come to set up the kingdom now, Lord? Are you going to, can we rule and reign with you in your kingdom? Can, Can you set our thrones next to you in Jerusalem? They didn't understand. They had preconceived ideas that caused them to struggle to accept Jesus as Messiah. Sometimes we have preconceived ideas that cause us to struggle to accept God. We struggle to accept that God could love us. We struggle to accept that God is on your side, that God is not your enemy. We struggle to accept that God is so great and so good that he can do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. 
our preconceived ideas limit us in receiving and in our relationship with God. We have misconceptions, misconceptions that are created by our culture. You know, our culture wants to relegate the kingdom and relegate God to an hour on Sunday morning, if that. But he won't be. It's impossible. We have misconceptions based on our family backgrounds and our experiences. We have misconceptions based on a, a mishmash of theology that's out there today. Sometimes our own experiences. But I want you to look at a verse of scripture where Jesus is talking to Pilate at his trial. And in verse number 36 of John 18, Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Jesus was saying, my kingdom did not originate in this world. My kingdom is not simply of this world. It doesn't have to take over the world system. Now, I'm not against Christians getting involved in politics. I think we need Christian politicians who can tell the truth. But his kingdom is not about politics. His kingdom is not about economics. His kingdom is not of this world. His kingdom would not come by revolution or by war. If you look at what his kingdom is in Romans chapter 14, verse number 17, he said, for the, Paul said, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. It's not in simple physical things, but in righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. The kingdom of God involves the lordship of Christ his power and spiritual activity in the lives of those who follow him. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. In Romans chapter 14 and verse number 17 in the New Living, it said, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink. And he's, he's writing to those who were keeping kosher food laws. And he said, but it's this, of living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. In another place, he said, for the kingdom of God is within you. My brothers and sisters, I want you to understand that everywhere you go, every, every day when you wake up, every place you, you walk into, the kingdom of God is walking into that place because the kingdom is within you. That's why we can celebrate today and understand the goodness of God as we worship together, even though we can't be together in the same physical address, because the kingdom of God is not limited by space. It's not limited by address. It's not limited by where you are, but the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom, the place of Christ's lordship, in our lives. Somebody said that the kingdom of God is the place where God's will is as perfectly done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the kingdom of God. If you'll look at Luke chapter 11, verse number 2. Luke chapter 11, verse number 2. Jesus was teaching his disciples to pray, and here is a kingdom prayer. And this prayer was not meant simply to be repeated and, and to be memorized, although we do that. It's, not, it's meant to be an outline for teaching. He said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, I have a relationship with God. Sometimes that's a misconception because sometimes our earthly fathers are imperfect or may not love us. But our Father which art in heaven, then hallowed be thy name or holy be thy name. We lift up your name. That's praise and worship. And then notice this next pr part of the prayer. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done as in heaven, so in earth. So hallowed be thy name. Your name be lifted up. You're my father. But then, Lord, I want your kingdom to come right now, right here, right where I am. I want your kingdom to come within my life. And then notice that last part, thy will be done as in heaven, so in earth. 
What a kingdom prayer to pray. How would it revolutionize our lives if every day we start out by saying, Lord, I want your kingdom to come in my life today. I want your will to be done in my life today as perfectly as it is in heaven. Lord, let your will be done as I go to work. Let your will be done as, as I'm on the, the auto route and someone cuts me off and, and the, I'm not going to say even to myself the words and I'm not going to react in anger, but let thy will be done in my life right now. What about when that person at work aggravates you? It may be probably over the phone or Skype or Zoom or Teams now, but they aggravate you and you're praying, Lord, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, I, I want your kingdom to come in my life today. Let your purpose be, it will radically transform your life. That kingdom prayer. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom in us, and this is so important to understand, the kingdom of God is not the church building. I appreciate, you know, we've got a beautiful church building, and I'm thankful for that. But the kingdom of God is not the church building. The church building is simply where the church comes to worship. The kingdom of God is within you. And as we look at this parable this morning, and he talks about yeast or leaven, and, and some believe that he, what he actually was talking about was sourdough. That, uh, that, that dough that you keep going and, and you keep splitting off. And, and in just about every other place where it's mentioned, it has a negative connotation. It's often used in the Old Testament to represent sin. They had to clean the leaven out of their house uh, when it came time for the Passover. And, and it represented sin. Why is that? Yeast itself is not a bad thing. But it's a graphic illustration not just of sin, but of influence. The power of the yeast in bread is that a little bit influences a whole lot of dough. We have influences within our lives. One of those is sin. The thing about sin is it starts out very small. And it, it may be a small indiscretion. It may be something that you look at and say, this is not something that's very important. But you see, the problem with sin is that sin begins to spread very rapidly. It's like your lawn. And, and you may have a perfectly pristine lawn. You get one weed, and if you don't look after it, it begins to spread very quickly. And it's amazing to me, why can't grass grow as well as weeds? It just spreads so quickly, and that's what sin does within our lives. Sin begins to overtake. Sin begins to, to over, overrun the good within our lives, and if we're not careful. One of our elders, Brother Thornhill, always used to say that sin will take you further than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay, and it will cost you more than you want to pay. Sin. Sin in traps. Sin holds tightly. Influence of sin. We see that influence. Jesus used the term leaven or yeast to talk about the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He talked about the leaven of the Pharisees, the leaven of the Sadducees. And what he was talking about was the pervasive influence of that teaching. You know, years ago it used to be that false teaching came in a book or a radio broadcast, and now it comes through the internet and social media and, and wherever you turn. And it begins to influence. There are people that are called social media influencers. Now, this just kind of kind of kills me, but I'm a little bit older, and it, it just kind of kills me because... You know, these are people who make a living simply influencing other people on social media, or they think they are anyway, and they get paid to do this. Can you imagine? Uh, they, they get so many people watching them, and, and so if they say that this is cool, then, then, you know, everybody goes and does what they suggest, and then if they say this is cool and that's not, everybody goes and does what they suggest, and, and they're social media influencers. We have so many influences in our lives today. 
whether it's on social media, whether it's the books we read, the, the media that we consume, they all influence us. We need to be careful about what we allow to influence our lives. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, in the New Living, Jesus said, don't let anyone, or sorry, Paul said, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that comes from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. You know, as a believer, Jesus was talking about, in, in this parable, he's not talking about sin, although sin corrupts and it ferments and it goes through your entire life. It begins with one little bit and then it begins to grow till it begins to take over your life the influence of those around us, but he's talking about the influence of the kingdom. My dear brothers and sisters, Paul talked about empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense. And there's a lot of that around there. There's a lot of it that, that pervades social media and YouTube, and you know, you start going down the rabbit holes on YouTube. High-sounding nonsense. The leaven of false doctrine. If you're a follower of Jesus, let me tell you today that what you, everything that you need is in this book and the 66 books that are contained within it. When you begin to read the 27 books of the New Testament, you begin to discover God's will for your life. That is kingdom influence in your life. I, I appreciate good literature that's written, but nothing can take the place of the Word of God within us. The Bible teaches us that we are born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God that lives and abides forever. This book brings the kingdom of God within our lives. It's how we know what is right and what is wrong. Jesus is putting a positive in their minds. The kingdom may start out small, but it grows rapidly. And that's the lesson of the parable of the mustard seed. History is hinged on what we would term small and insignificant people and actions. When the church started in the book of Acts, it was only 120 people. By the time the day was done, there were 3,000. Growth. This, this woman put a little bit of yeast. A little bit of leaven. God's intention is for his kingdom to have an, in, an irresistible influence in the world that it's existing in. God's intention is for his kingdom to have an irresistible influence in our lives as we live in the world. That it leaves no part of your life untouched. The influence of the kingdom. Whether it's in what I say or what I do or how I live or how I look. That all of these things are influenced. The kingdom brings change within our lives. Look at Romans chapter 12 verse number 1. This is the message. It said place your life before God. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life. Take your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. The New Living Translation that you see on your screen says, to give your bodies to God because of all He has done for you. Let them be a living and a holy sacrifice, the kind He will find acceptable. And this is the way to worship Him. What Jesus was saying was, let the leaven, when the kingdom is inserted in your life, its influence will be profound. It won't just be for an hour on Sunday morning, but it'll be every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. The kingdom of God is at work and at influence. The kingdom and the influence of the kingdom within our lives. The leaven had to be inserted. The yeast can't sit on the counter and yell at the bread and have an influence. God didn't approach the growth of his kingdom by a hands-off approach. He didn't stand on a cloud and holler down to men and women. But the Bible teaches us that God became flesh and dwelt among us. 
John 1.14 said that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The leaven, the yeast, the influence was injected into the world when Jesus came. It was placed within and it began to permeate the world. And for the kingdom to be effective within our lives, it must not simply be around us. It must not simply be Sunday school teachings, teachings or lessons that we learn. It must not simply be a head knowledge of the scripture or, or the, the people that are around us. But the kingdom has to be within. Have you allowed Jesus Christ to rule and reign within your life? his kingdom to be the predominant force and influence of your life. The kingdom must be within us. But even more than that, God places you and I in the world that we live in, in the neighborhood that we live in, in the workplaces that we're in, to be the influence of the kingdom. Regardless of what is going on around us, and regardless how emotions may be flaring up, regardless of what people may be saying or what people may even be doing to you, we are to be kingdom influence in the world that is around us. In Matthew 5, verse 13, he said, Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt hath lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing. But to be cast out and be trodden underfoot of men. Salt is another substance that influences everything that it touches. Then Jesus didn't stop there. He said, but ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Influence. The parable, the lesson of the bread dough is that believers are called to influence the world. We're not called to be influenced by the world. One of the great struggles that we have are the many voices in our culture that speak so many different things. But Christians are not called to live by the values of our culture. The values of our culture change so rapidly and completely. They run in cycles and they change. We are to be influenced by the word of God. We're to be influenced by the teachings of Christ and the work of the spirit within our lives that make us to be more like Jesus. Not just so that we can come and gather together in a holy huddle and celebrate how good we are and how blessed we are, but so that we as the people of God can be God's kingdom in the world and that we can influence the world around us by what Jesus is doing within us. I'm going to invite you right now to bow your head with me as we pray. And if you're a follower of Jesus today, would you make it your prayer? Lord, let your kingdom come in my life. Let your will be done in my life. But Lord, don't let me be selfish with my life. Let my life be an influence for your kingdom wherever I am. Let every area of my life reflect Jesus to a world that desperately needs to know him. If you're watching this today and you're investigating faith, you're, you're checking out Christianity, you're checking out church, this is about more than simply joining a church or going to church. This is about having a relationship with Jesus. This is about knowing him. And that starts by having his kingdom come in your life. It happens by very simply saying, I am a sinner. I have sinned and I've done wrong. And and. I need forgiveness, and I want a right relationship with God. And I know that Jesus died for me on the cross, that I could be forgiven. That's a beginning. When you begin to pray that prayer, that's the beginning. It'll lead you on 
to water baptism. That's part of initiation into God's kingdom is water baptism in the name of Jesus. If you haven't done that, we have water. We can still baptize. And, and we have water that's warm all the time. We'll be happy to baptize you as you become part of God's kingdom. And then he puts his kingdom life in you through the Holy Spirit. Oh, what a blessing it is. If you have never started on that journey of faith, let me encourage you to do that this morning as we pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your influence in our lives. I thank you for the way that you work in each one of us. And Lord, I pray that your hand would be at work in each believer who is watching this today and watching an archive. Lord, I pray that our lives will be reflections of your kingdom in our world. Lord, that we would always be mindful that we are citizens of a heavenly kingdom. Because, Lord, sometimes it's so easy to get caught up in the things of earth. Lord, I pray for that person watching today that you've been working in their life to bring them to you. Lord, the things that used to make them happy aren't making them happy anymore. The things that used to satisfy just aren't. And Lord, that emptiness within is crying out to you today. Lord, I pray as they pray that you would forgive them of their sins and that you would come into their life. Lord, I pray that something supernatural would transpire right now. Lord, I pray that in the name of Jesus. I pray for that person that has never been water baptized in your precious name. And I pray today you'll speak to them. I pray that, Lord, your influence of your kingdom would be expanded within their life. And Lord, I pray that that kingdom life of the baptism of the Spirit would be poured out in believers in their homes today. Lord, that you would be at work, and we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And today, as we get ready to close our service, I do want to say a, a very special birthday wishes to uh, Sister Diana Cortez. Happy birthday. And uh, to Ray Ann George today, happy birthday. And we offer you best wishes today. I'm not going to sing. But best wishes, happy birthday to you today. God bless you. Thank you for being with us today. And until we're together again, may God cause his face to shine upon you. May his blessing be your portion this week.